Welcome to this forum featuring, featuring candidates for Fire District 5 Commissioner Position 2. It's sponsored by a partnership among the League of Women Voters of Snohomish County, Snow Isle Libraries, the Sky Valley Chamber of Commerce, and the Sultan School District. I'm your moderator, Karen Matson, a member of the League of Women Voters. And with us tonight are candidates for commissioner, uh, commissioner position two for Fire District Five. Those candidates are Deborah Chase and Misty Halverson. The League thanks both of you for running for office, for your willingness to serve the community if you're elected, and for taking the time to participate in this forum. It's the policy of the League to be nonpartisan. Therefore, we do not endorse or oppose candidates or parties. We do take positions on issues which we've studied and upon which we've come to consensus. Ground rules for this forum were sent ahead of time to all the candidates, but for the, for the sake of the audience, let me take a moment to explain the question and answer period rules. Opening and closing questions have been shared with the candidates. Other questions have not been shared. However, we have made each candidate aware of the issue areas this forum plans to cover. And we appreciate the community members who sent us recommendations about those issue areas. I'll pose the questions. Each candidate will have 60 seconds to respond. 90 seconds will be allowed for answers to the final question. And I'll make sure to remind you of that change when the time comes. We're using a countdown timer, which is visible to all the candidates. It shows elapsed time and it alerts candidates when there are 15 seconds left and then when time is up. Time limits on answers will be strictly enforced. When you see the timer turn red and hear the chime, you must be finished answering. The order of the questions will alternate. First one person, then the other will begin. I'll change the starting order each time. I did a random selection and it came up that Ms. Chase will go first on the first question, followed by Ms. Halverson. And with just two candidates, you'll then move into the answer to the next question. So it'll be Ms. Chase, Ms. Halverson, Ms. Halverson, Ms. Chase, Ms. Chase, like that back and forth. So with that, we're ready to go on this first question, which you have 60 seconds. Ms. Chase, you'll take the lead. What qualifications and experience make you a strong candidate for this position? Well, first I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters and everyone who's helped with this. It's a great opportunity uh, to participate and I appreciate it very much. So what makes me a strong candidate for the position is first and foremost, I have prior elected experience. I served on the Kenmore um, Council and was mayor my last two years, helped incorporate the city and spent six years there working with other government agencies. Also made sure that the citizens input was always gathered ahead of time and brought forward into any decisions that we made. Secondly, my professional experience, I have an MBA in accounting and finance. I was a project manager for over 30 years where I managed between six million and $60 million budgets. And I believe that expertise would be really helpful on our board as we make financial decisions, especially with all of the growth that's happening. And growth is something that was very important uh, to attend to in Kenmore. We were going through exponential growth during my time there, and I'd like to bring that experience to our community as well. Thank you, Ms. Chase. Ms. Halverson. The opportunity to serve as commissioner is something I'm excited about and well-suited for. I see the job as translating citizens' priorities into how we provide and fund emergency services by asking good questions and, and turning answers into action. My background includes all those skills. From my legal experience, I know the importance of listening and acting in the best interest of others. My education and critical thinking skills allow me to find solutions to complex problems. As a former state tax attorney, I appreciate issues about taxation and public budgets. As a dental health professional and small business owner, I understand service and going the extra mile for people. I was blessed to grow up in a firefighter's household and I have a deep love for the fire service. I know the commitment and hard work it takes to provide help to neighbors. I'm a communicator and a collaborator and I'm honored to be endorsed by two candidates from our recent primary. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Halverson. Next question. What do you believe to be the primary job of a fire commissioner? 
I believe the primary job of the fire commissioner is to act as an advocate for the community. We are here to oversee. Uh, we're not here to do the fire chief's job but it is important that we are active in the community and ask them what it is that is important to them and turn that and translate that into action in terms of how we move our fire district forward. Thank you, Ms. Chase. Uh, thank you. Yes, the, the commissioner role is a legislative role, very similar, in fact, identical to that of a city council member in a city setting. It's giving direction, setting policies, but they also approve all expenditures, all of the vouchers and must approve all the budgets. So they are key and integral in setting the priorities for the district, especially as you move forward in time. Um, I have a lot of experience with the government that's needed to do that. I also have a lot of experience in getting input from the community, which I also believe is a very important role for a commissioner making sure that you reach not just the people who are, have already been listening and asking questions, but that you find ways to outreach to everyone to give them the opportunity to get their concerns heard and make sure that you're, you're providing the very best service you possibly can for the community. Thank you. Ms. Halverson, I have to ask, did I cut you off prematurely on that last question? Did you have more you wanted to say? No? Okay. All right. I, I, I felt as if I might have. I just wanted to be sure about that. All right, Ms. Chase, could you take the lead on this question, please? Uh, what are the biggest challenges facing this fire district and what are its greatest strengths? Ah, good question, compound. <laughs> uh, the current challenges are, uh, we have a funding levy that's going away at the end of this next year. So making sure that we get out and help citizens understand why we'll be asking for a levy, levy lid lift to replace that revenue. And additionally, we have a new chief coming on board at the beginning of the year because our current chief is retiring. And so making sure that that new chief has all the information that they need, gets introduced to the community properly and making sure it's a fit as we go forward with a new commissioner, excuse me, new chief. Um, and then the second part, what are the greatest strengths? As I've been around doorbelling, I have gotten nothing but compliments about our staff and the service that they provide. And so we wanna make sure that whatever we do going forward, we retain that culture here in our community. The, uh, I, the, the number of people who've had EMT calls, et cetera, who have complimented the people who come to their door is su such a strength that we wanna make sure we continue that. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Halverson, your thoughts? The fire district is in the business of planning ahead and being ready for whatever may happen. They don't control traffic and growth, but they must prepare and respond by investing in personnel, equipment, and procedures. Our community is growing, but we aren't large. District 5 responds to approximately 1,200 calls per year or three per day on average. We must continue to have crews who are prompt and fully trained, the public understands it is the chief's job to ensure this readiness and the commissioners oversee his or her efforts. Our fire chief will retire at the end of 2021 and hiring the right leader is important and is underway. Another important issue is taxes and choices in how we fund District 5's needs when the current m and levy expires. Last, we will cons consult voters in 2022 and recommend a solution for 2023. Lastly, uh, it's time to move forward with an in-house medic program, the feasibility and affordability. Thank you, Ms. Halverson, I appreciate that. Next question, you take the lead on, please. Are there issues in the fire district which arose from the pandemic? If so, how would you address them? Yes. The issues in the pandemic are worldwide. Obviously, things have changed all over the world as a product of this pandemic and the millions of people who have died and how it is that we have to move forward that is not likely to end in the near future in terms of how we handle the pandemic. And this district has done a fantastic job of through their preparation, their PPE and all their uh, all their matters, they have handled it absolutely correctly. And 
it is not going to end anytime soon. We simply have to maintain our dil diligence, our proven diligence to keep our community safe and to keep our firefighters safe. Thank you. Ms. Chase, your thoughts on issues arising from the pandemic? Uh, yeah. Ms. Chase, you're muted. Sorry, I thought I unmuted me. <laughs> We're there now. Uh, the response of the fire district was excellent. We did do a great job of immediately having PPE on hand that was needed for the pandemic. Staying up to speed, the chief regularly reported in the meetings that about where we were, what was happening, et cetera. Uh, he did a great job of making sure that they were ahead of the curve, so to speak, in hiring replacement PPE. And, and he had, did a good job of forecasting how long it would last. The challenges that are going to happen that we're starting to see nationally and not just locally are keeping staff on board. We have more and more staff um, attrition happening in districts around us and people are getting burned out from the measures that they've had to take for the pandemic. So addressing them means making sure that we're, we're continuing to hire good employees, we're investing the time and the training in them to keep them and that we continue to make our culture one where a, our personnel want to stay. Thank you very much. Ms. Chase, what part should the fire district play in the environmental health of your area? Uh, excellent question. So for environmental health, um, any kind of fire is going to create some sort of environmental hazard. And already our staff does a great job of uh, maintaining that, containing it as best they can, and they have follow protocols that are fire industry standard in washing out their gear, et cetera, when it's done. So the way that we best manage it is through operations and maintenance practices. But we also have a responsibility, and we've done some of this already, to help our individuals understand wildfire issues and fire prevention overall, having that educational materials for our citizens easily uh, and readily available on our website is something that is, has started to happen and it's good to see. And then finally, we should be adopting any new protocols that are environmentally uh, oriented as quickly as possible. And it's important to note that our new station is LEED certified, which is Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design and was built to be environmentally friendly. Thank you, Ms. Halverson. Living in the Sky Valley, we all appreciate magnificent environment every day. Each of us feels a part of keeping it healthy. I believe that minimizing environmental damage starts with rapid response before things escalate. Our new public safety center on Highway 2 and the staff are the crown jewels in protecting the environment. The building consolidates personnel and equipment from several sites to a single place. It provides an ideal location to respond from. It allows quick response to wildland fires and nearby river access for water emergencies. We can feel proud of its eco-friendly heating, lighting, and water system. It was also built with the foresight and more than a million dollars from the state to serve as an emergency operations center to host fire districts and other agencies working together in a large disaster. Thank you. Ms. Halverson, as a commissioner, how do you plan to assure the public that your staff has the proper, proper level of training for their jobs? It's important that the public appreciate District 5's readiness and history of outstanding performance in fighting fires and offering emergency medical response. Washington State established standards for fire, firefighting and EMS. All firefighters receive standard training and District 5 crews meet the requirements. Medical personnel are overseen by a Snohomish County physician who ensures those standards are met. While commissioners don't perform these services or manage them directly, they do oversee and ensure they are performed well at the least cost for the taxpayers. District 5's blending, blended staffing model of full-time and part-time responders is the ultimate expression of inclusion in hiring and training and is cost-effective for the community. The full-time team has the job of training recruits and part-time staff they take this role seriously and are accountable. Thank you very much. Ms. Chase, your thoughts on staff training? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, 
the role of the commissioner is oversight here. And so in order to assure that the, the newest training is always incorporated and that every single member of the staff is receiving the training that is required, uh, means we need to have a good solid training plan in place. And then I believe it's the role of the commissioners to review that annually and make sure that all of the required certification is being met and is listed, as well as any ongoing skills and additional skills that we would like our staff to have. And, and that means it can be broader than what might be the minimum required standards. Then it, there should be a quarterly report to the board on how we are meeting the, the the training plan, what are our goals and have we met them? How many employees have been trained? Have we missed any? And then an annual report to the citizens, I believe is important so that all of us can see what a great job we're doing and have the confidence that all of our staff are trained as they should be. Thank you. Ms. Chase, take the lead on this one. Tell us about your ideas for working productively with staff, commission colleagues and members of the public whose ideas may be different from yours. Uh, that's an excellent question. It's sometimes difficult to, to take your own personal hat off and listen to others, but I've done that in the past in Kenmore, and let me give you an example. We had a, a road closure that had to happen for bridge replacement. Either it was to be partial or to be com a complete closure. Shorter time frame, less money to do the, the full closure and get it replaced, or a longer time frame, more expensive to do it the other way. Personally, I would have loved to have gone longer. It definitely impacted me individually, but I made sure that we reached out to our citizens, put up a reader board to those who cross that bridge regularly of a, a meeting to learn about it and give input. And when our citizens in that part of the community came to the meeting, learned all of the details, were given all the options, they almost to a person wanted the shorter time frame, less expensive, complete closure, and agreed that they could put up with it. So that's what I voted for. That's what I do here. Ms. Halverson. They say nothing great is ever accomplished alone. I truly believe this. We have to work together and build what we want, doing so through respect and understanding. I'm a communicator and a collaborator. These are important skills in all areas of my life to help those I care about and to explore areas of shared interest. These skills are also what enable me to receive endorsements from our community leaders, including former opponents following the primaries. I have the heart of an advocate, which means I listen and I'm able to transform listening and learning into action. I follow up, offer to help and hold people accountable. I persevere. I hope to have the opportunity to serve as fire commissioner where I can use all of these abilities to benefit District 5. Thank you. Ms. Halverson, what advantage or disadvantage might there be in transitioning to a regional fire authority? I think that the uh, advantages or disadvantage of that would be that we would lose a sense of community. The district has grown and expanded and been absolutely great in quality and that has continued to enhance. And I think that there is a great power in keeping things local and having community investment. And I think that the disadvantage will be that that sense of community and true caring at a gut level, at a community level would be lost. Thank you, Ms. Chase. I agree with Misty that there are definitely disadvantages around any sense of loss of community. And a lot of people really do enjoy having our local, but there are advantages to it as well. Uh, some that I see is you'd have more bench depth for any of the skill sets that are needed. Uh, but you, you then take the step back and say, does that outweigh knowing that most of your firefighters live in your community and that you see their faces regularly instead of somebody different every time? So I could go on and on with both advantages and disadvantages, but the reality is if we were to consider doing that as a community, it's a community decision. It's not a board decision. And what I would do if indeed that proposal came to us is make sure that the community was involved in conversations about whether that was something they were even interested in before I'd ever consider 
putting it on the ballot for the community to choose. Ms. Chase, lead off on the answer to the final question, please. What additional issues or information would you like to bring to the attention of the community? When the timer comes up, you'll see that it provides you with a minute and a half for a response. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you. So there are a couple. We've, we've touched on them briefly, but one of them is the, the need for a levy lid lift. Um, both of us talked about the fact that we have a maintenance and operations levy that's expiring at the end of the coming year. And that's going to lose us $450,000 in revenue. And, and that's an important piece of revenue to keep our services at the level that we currently have and that our, our citizens truly should expect. And so we're going to have to bring the information to them requesting a levy lid lift. Levy lid lifts mean that you're reauthorizing going back up toward or to the maximum that's allowed statutorily for the amount that can be collected on your property taxes. And over time that deteriorates, the, the amount decreases as more people come on board and as the 1% for total collections uh, is implemented. So that's something that I feel very strongly we need to educate our citizens about the impacts of at, long before we ever ask them to vote on a levy lid lift. The other one is the growth impacts and, and what is truly going to change or does it change as we have higher and higher density of population. The only way to get at that is to start having metrics that are a little more uh, representative of what's happening. Break down our calls information that comes to the to the um, board monthly into geographic calls, as well as break up our EMS ones into more detail so we can see it coming. Thank you so much. Ms. Halverson, you have the last word tonight. Same question, a minute and a half. Thank you. Two topics come to mind right away. First of all, I'd like to give a shout out to District 5's amazing responders during COVID. Through their careful preparation, use of PPE, and overall protocols, there have been no cases of contracting COVID during aid calls and no spreading of the disease to the community. This is a remarkable achievement and I support it going forward. Second, I want to pay attention to the community situation and I'd like to mention wages. During the pandemic, we are seeing jobs posted here in our community for delivery drivers, restaurant servers, and other entry-level role, roles at wages higher than those paid to our part-time emergency responders. I think District 5 would be well served to consider increasing compensation for that staff in line with their special skills and extended training. Of course, there are many facets that need to be considered, but let's have that discussion. Thank you very much. Well, that brings us to the end of the forum. Each of the partners of this forum coalition want to tell you thank you for joining us and to thank you to, to you for running for office. A recording of this forum and our others will be available at the League of Women Voters of Snohomish County website and our YouTube channel. You can find links to both of those on our website at LWV Snoho, that's lwvsnoho.org. We encourage our listeners to explore additional information about these candidates and all the candidates in the upcoming election. The Snohomish County Voter Pamphlet will be mailed to residences starting tomorrow, October 13. Vote411.org, sponsored by the League of Women Voters, is another good source for nonpartisan voting information. Finally, general election ballots will be mailed on October 14th, and election day is November 2nd. Please vote. This concludes our candidate forum. Thank you for joining us.